and I don't know about you, but I just love doctors who have near-death experiences. <laughs> it changes their whole attitude about everything. It's just so delightful. So he's going to tell you all about his story. So let's give a warm welcome to Tony Sicoria. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I am Willis, and the, on behalf of the INDS, thank you very much for inviting me and for allowing me to be part of your activities today. Um, I'm going to start out a little bit by talking about who I am, um, or who I was, probably a better way to deal with it. Um, I was, I grew up in upstate New York. And I was product of the Citadel Military Academy. Um, I have a PhD in physiology and cellular biophysics, and I was a basic scientist um, before I even went to medical school. And when I went to medical school, I decided to go into orthopedic surgery because it was a lot of fun. I got to fix broken people, and I grew up as a kid fixing cabinets and fixing cars and fixing things, so this seemed like a short step for me. But I was on a very academic sort of a pathway in life. I was doing a lot of publishing, I was doing a lot of studies. I was on staff at Syracuse University and teaching staff, and I had residents and other professionals who were coming through the office and, and working with me. And at one point, I was being considered to be on staff at the university if I wanted to go up there. And that was pre-1994. And so I was a fairly rigid thinking person, and I grew up with um, the idea that I didn't take new ideas easily. You had to prove to me that something was real. And I would certainly listen, but I wouldn't just be accepting of anything that somebody came along with. And then on August 21st of 1994, um, my wife's family had a tradition of having a huge birthday party because there were five people who had birthday parties in August, so they would make a communal birthday party. And this year it was going to be at Sleepy Hollow Lake, which is in just in Athens, New York, just below Albany. And Sleepy Hollow Lake always has its sort of ominous connotation to it. And I was designated the barbecue guy, and I was outside cooking food, and everybody else was up on the second floor of a pavilion painting faces, having fun, and there were probably 30 people, um, just family members, who were upstairs. And I wasn't paying attention to the fact that there was some dark clouds coming my way. And there had been some dri drizzles here and there, but I just ignored it. And somewhere in the mid-afternoon, my uh, brother-in-law, Jody, came over and said, you know, why don't you go upstairs and get something to eat, and I'll watch the pit for a while. And so I started to walk upstairs, and I thought, well, I'll stop and call my mother and just make sure she's okay. And so I stopped at a payphone, which was attached to the building, and I was absolutely oblivious to anything going on around me. And I tried to call, and it rang seven or eight times. Nobody picked up. And I was, I was just getting ready to hang the phone up. And I had the phone maybe six or seven inches from my face. And all of a sudden, I heard a loud crack. And I simultaneously saw this big flash of light come out of the phone and hit me right square in the face. And it just sent me flying backwards like a rag doll. And, and I remembered very vividly every millisecond of time and 
as I got thrown backwards, I had this very strange sensation of suddenly moving forwards. And I remembered standing there just like this, and I, I looked down at my feet, and, and I looked around, and the phone was dangling, and I was just absolutely confused. <coughs> I didn't understand what had happened. I knew that I'd been hit by lightning. I knew that I had been thrown backwards, but here I am standing in one spot, and nothing was making sense. And just about that moment, I, where I'm standing is at the bottom of a staircase, and the phone is here, and the staircase is here, and my mother-in-law is up about 10 stairs, starts screaming like a lunatic, and she's running right at me. And I'm standing here like a deer in the headlights, and I see her coming at me, and she just went right by. And I thought, okay, <clears throat> where's she going? <laughs> so I, I, you know, I'm standing here, and she's coming right at me, and she goes right by, and I turn to see where she's going. I'm on the ground. <laughs> and I remembered saying to myself, excuse my French, oh shit, <laughs> I'm dead. <laughs> And I, it was an absolute shock because there was no sense of anything. I expected bells or whistles or somebody to say, hey, buddy, you passed on, but there was nothing. It, and the only sensation I had was that little bit of movement forward, which was essentially my spirit leaving the body because it was going to go for a ride someplace. And and I thought, this is pretty amazing. I'm, so now I'm standing here, and I'm watching. And as it turns out, there was a nurse waiting to use the phone. Now, we're in the middle of nowhere. And there's a nurse waiting to use the phone. And, you know, I've had to think about that long and hard, too. Obviously, it, it was, I was not supposed to be dead permanently because if somebody took out an insurance policy to make sure that I wouldn't be. <laughs> And as I stood there and watched them, she's dropping down to do CPR, my mother-in-law is screaming, and there's other people coming up, and, and I'm trying to call to them. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm calling their names, and I can hear them, I can see them, but nobody can see or hear me. And so at that point, I, I thought, well, I guess there's no point in staying here. But there were several realizations that came to me at that moment. One, I was aware that I was thinking. I was having every single thought that I would have if I was in normal form. I was even thinking about it in the vernacular that I would think about. It. And, and I came to the realization that, geez, whoever we are, we always are. What was on the ground was nothing more than an empty shell. And I contained what I, my essence, my spirit, contained all of my memories, all of my thoughts, all of who I was. And so that that thought, which seemed like it was a, a long thought, was probably half a second in our time. And then I realized that Okay, if that's true, and it certainly would seem to be by my experience, then I've been here before. I've done this multiple times because my soul is always who it is. Like me or not like me, I'm still the way I've always been for eternity. And so I've come to this realization and I'm like, all right, well, very dispassionately, and that was the other thing that was very interesting about it. It was there was no emotion associated with the fact that I was looking at my body. It, it was just, it was very dispassionate. I was just like, well, I'm dead. I guess there's no point in staying around here. So I decided I'm gonna walk up the stairs. So I don't know where I was going, but I seemed to be drawn in that direction. As I start going up the stairs, I'm looking down at the stairs as I'm walking, and I see my legs start to dissolve. And I think, okay. <laughs> I'm not quite sure I like this, but 
it just seemed like that was what was going to happen. And it's, by the time I got to the top of the stairs, I no longer had form. I was just a ball of energy. And at the top of the stairs, the stairs cut back the other way to get into the pavilion. And I just walked through the wall. I didn't walk through the wall. I floated through it. As I was going through, and I was very aware that I was going through on the diagonal. And I was going upwards. And I saw my kids and my wife and my family and friends. And I knew that they would all be fine and not to worry about it. So I just continued on my journey. And when I got outside of the building is when things really started to change. Because when I got outside, I suddenly felt like I had fallen into a river of bluish white light. And it was a river of pure positive energy. If you could imagine a term, let me back up. There is a term in science called absolute zero. It's a term that when something is so cold that absolutely no motion can occur of the molecules. And what I felt in the bluish white light was absolute love and absolute peace. There was absolutely nothing else but that. And I remember that it was so strong, it was almost palpable. You could almost feel it. And I remember thinking, I could measure this. I guess the scientist, the scientist never dies. Um, but I was, I remember being surrounded by this feeling and thinking, hey, this is the most unbelievable thing that you could ever experience. And then the realization came to me that this is God. God is pure love and pure peace and is a force that goes through everything. And what I fell into, the this river of pure positive energy, is something that flows through everything that we know. So the old term, God is everywhere, well, I can understand that. I didn't get to see any, I was felt kind of cheated by that. I didn't see any grandparents to come and welcome me, or um, I didn't see any angels. Um, but I was very sure that what I was experiencing was real, and my mind racing this whole time. And as I as this started, I became very aware of movement. I was moving someplace, and it it had both speed and direction. So I was. I was accelerating, and I could feel a sense of that, that I was going someplace. It wasn't getting warm, so I felt safe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least for the time being. <laughs> and then, as I'm going along, I'm, I'm analyzing all of the things that I'm, that I'm sensing. And again, but there's no emotion associated with all of it. It's all pure intellect. And I, I had a kind of what I call a mini life review of just the high points and low points and there wasn't much discussion or, or really delving into it. And right about the time that I thought this is the most absolutely wonderful thing that could ever happen to somebody. It was like there was somebody flipped the switch and I was in pain. And suddenly I was back in his body. And I remember, I remembered screaming in the top of my head. <laughs> Obviously, I'm still unconscious, so nobody's hearing anything. But I was really pissed. I did not want to come back. And I remember begging God, angels, anyone who would listen, please don't make me go back. And it hurt. I mean, you know, I just, I had a burn on my face and a burn on my foot, and. And I wasn't exactly happy about feeling all this stuff again. So I went from absolute bliss to, to being miserable. And there was some lady pushing on my chest and I wanted to probably stop. 
but and at that point I, I wasn't I wasn't conscious yet. So but she did stop, so something must have happened. And it seemed like several minutes before I could open my eyes. And then they didn't focus very well. And I just kind of laid there and eventually I was able to sit up and and I, re I remember trying to say something, and I wish I just kept my mouth shut because it was kind of stupid what came out. But I looked at her and I said, it's okay, I'm a doctor. <laughs> and, and she just looked at me and she said, well, you were a minute ago. <laughs> and I said, well, okay. So I, at that point I shut up because I knew nothing was making sense. And the police came and wanted to rush me to the hospital and they said, what's the point? You, see, you know, you're either alive or you're dead. There's not much in between. So I'm just going to go home. Um, so I, I went upstairs and of course everybody at that point was aware of it and they took me home and I saw my cardiologist and my neurologist and they ran all these tests and they said, well, they said the same thing. You're either alive or dead. There's not much in between. So move on. Thought, okay. Except that for about a week I felt really crappy. And <laughs> thankfully I had the week off anyway. And But I couldn't, I knew that I had had some injury to my brain because I couldn't remember people's names. I could look at you and know, I know you're my relative. I know you really well. I have no idea what your name is. And I, but I know where it is. It's over in a drawer here someplace. But I can't get to it. And there were a lot of things like that. But that just went away. And it took about a week. And it seemed like everything went back to normal. Except that I was left with this, what was that all about? And I really struggled with trying to understand what was happening. and and what I had experienced. I started to, to get books, and the first book I got my hands on was Daniel Brinkley's Saved by the Light. Um, and Daniel had gone through a similar experience. And actually, it was the only book available at the time that even talked about it. And and I, I was a bit afraid to talk to anybody about this sort of stuff, because I thought, and I first thing I thought of was that Somebody's going to think I'm a fruitcake. They're going to report me to the state and I'll lose my license. So I'll just keep my mouth shut and I'll talk to friends about it and see where it goes from there. And then it seemed like within a couple of weeks, I started to have this insatiable desire to hear piano music, and which, you know, which was a bit of a departure for me because I was a kid of the 60s, I grew up with rock and roll, and my, my mother had made me take piano lessons when I was seven, and I hated it, and I wanted to go fishing and go play baseball, and so I did the year at her request, actually it wasn't, it wasn't a request, it was a demand, um, but I dutifully did that, and, and promptly quit. So. You know, I, at this point, I'm, I was 42 when this happened, and I was seven when I had taken piano lessons, so that wasn't once they got left with that. So I had no real desire for piano music, and then all of a sudden I had this incredible desire to hear it. And it was so strong that I drove to Albany, which is about an hour away, to find some place that even sold classical piano music. And I, I found a store and I walked in and it seemed like this CD just jumped off the rack right into my hands. And it was Vladimir Ashkenazi, famous Russian pianist, playing his favorite Chopin. And I could not stop listening. I listened on the way to work, on the way home from work. I made everybody 
that the hospital listened to it, and the, the family listened to it, and I think everybody was pretty sick. Um, I think I actually wore out two volumes before I finally said, okay, obviously there's more to this story. I, and I came to the realization that I wanted to learn how to play that music. Now, that's a big leap. Seeing how I, I don't know how to play, and I don't have a piano, but I was certain that I needed to learn how to play it. So, magically, I order all the music that's on the CD, and of course, when it came, it was like Greek. I didn't have the faintest idea how to read it. And, but I was determined to try to teach myself. So I, I bought some books on how to learn piano. And the day before all of this happened, one of the babysitters came and said, I have a piano that I need to store at your house for a year. <laughs> okay. That's pretty fortuitous. I suddenly want to learn how to play and the piano appears. So in comes this old piano and I had gotten I had just gotten these books and perfect timing. So I sat down and I started to teach myself how to play which is really, and I don't know what I was thinking, but I was determined. And I would get up at four o'clock and I would practice till 6.30 when I went to work. And then when I came home, I would practice until I couldn't see straight. And I became almost a religious zealot because I, I really thought that the only reason I was here was because it had something to do with this music. And right, right about then, so we're, we're about several months into this, one night I have a dream. And the dream was like an out-of-body experience. I'm, I'm actually standing outside of myself, standing behind myself. I'm watching me play at a concert hall and I'm listening to this music and it's nothing I've ever heard before. And suddenly it come, I come to the realization, this is not somebody else's music, this is mine. So now I really start to listen. And, and, and at the end of the, the, one, the one piece, the ending is kind of this loud crashing ending and it woke me up and I sat up on the edge of the bed and it's 3.15 and I'm like, wow, that was really strange. And I got up and I, I went out to the old piano and I, and I was just plunking out the, some of the melodies that I had heard. And I thought, oh, this is nuts, I'm going to bed. So I went back to sleep and the next day when, and from that day forward, whenever I would sit down at the piano and start to play, so with the music. And it played exactly the way I heard it in the dream whenever I sat down. If I tried to ignore it, it was like a little two-year-old. So, pay attention to me. And if I didn't, it would start to come when I didn't want to hear it. It would come when I was working, or it would come when I was trying to do something else. And so I started, you know, whenever I sat down to play my lessons that I gave myself, I would play that first or I would work on some part of it. And I didn't have the faintest idea how to write anything, but I would take and I would write little snippets down of just the notes so that maybe it would remind me later on if I ever got to write it. And I would throw it in a drawer and then just laboriously did that on, on a regular basis. And in one day I was <laughs> trying to, I'm still trying to teach myself this music on the CD. One of the pieces was Chopin's Fantasy Impromptu, which is a, a technically difficult piece, and I had no business trying to learn it, but it didn't matter. But I couldn't make the two hands match up. And I was, I was banging on the piano, and my daughter's best friend's mom came in, Penny Cypress, and Penny came in and said, what in the world are you doing? And, I, and I, I said, well, I'm trying to learn this piece. And she's an accomplished musician. And, and I said, but the hands won't match up. 
And she looked at me and she said, they're not supposed to. And I said, well, why? And she said, it's a polyrhythm. And I thought, okay. <laughs> and I just looked at her stupidly and said, what's a polyrhythm? And she said, I'm not even gonna try to explain this to you. She said, it's so clear that you need to get a teacher and I have somebody that I think would work for you. So she gave me the name of one of the professors at Hartwick College, which is in the town, and Sandy McCain. Sandy was trained at Juilliard and was a fabulous you know, concert pianist and teacher. And so I called her up and said, you know, would you take on an old guy that's trying to learn some new tricks? And I told her the story and she said, well, bring me a few pieces of music and and let me see if I can work with you. And so I brought the first movement of the Moonlight Sonata, the military polonaise, and the um, fantasy impromptu. So I, I, I start to play these things for her, and, and she says, okay, stop. And she was very nice, and she just said, I don't want to see you play them again. She said, you, you have no foundation to be able to play those things. Mm -hmm and you're just harming yourself um, by trying to do it without any training. I said, okay. So we started at the bottom. I had to learn scales and the fingering and Hannah and the journey and everybody under the sun that forms the foundation and the building blocks for real music. And that was, well, we started in 1998 and she's still doing it. And one of the things that, that changed was in 2002, I started to go to an adult music camp. Uh, it's actually an adult piano camp in Bennington, Vermont. Um, for, it's a week long of just indulgence. Just, you get to play piano 24 hours a day if you want. And it's a great experience, and they have a wonderful chef, and you just eat food and play piano. <laughs> it doesn't get much better than that. And in 2006, when I went, the director's sister, um, Erica Vanderloon Feigen, who was at that time the number one salesperson for Steinway in New York City, and she had just switched companies. She was up. She had switched to Bosendorfer, and she was there just with a bunch of her pianos, just demonstrating them for people. And we got talking about this crazy story. And she looked at me and said, you know, this is a story that needs to be told, and there's only one person that can do it, and that's Oliver Sacks. And I said, okay. But I didn't even know who Oliver Sacks was at the time. And I just forgot about it until August. That was in May. About August of that year, I get a phone call from Oliver Sacks <laughs> and wants me to come down to New York City to, to talk. And I thought, okay, that's pretty neat. If nothing else, I get to meet somebody famous. And so I went down and I spent the day with him. And an absolutely incredible man an incredible intellect, uh, and always the consummate scientist. And we talked about all the things that had happened, and you know, I had a very sort of spiritual approach to what had happened, and he certainly is on the opposite side, and he takes a very anatomical and neuroanatomical view of everything that happened. Um, but the most important thing that he did was, as I was standing at the door to leave, he looked me right in the eye and seemed like he looked right through me. And he said, the music from the dream went through an awful lot of trouble to get here. The least you can do is write it. And I thought, I'm going to do that. And I had the faintest idea how to write music, but that hadn't stopped me before. And so, but I was determined. I went home and I bought a program called Sibelius, which is writing music for dummies. 
<laughs> and, and it works really well for that um, if you don't really know anything about writing music. And so I spent the next seven or eight months writing a piece of music, some of which you saw on the, on the uh, DVD. Um, it's, I call it the lightning sonata. Um, the musicologist tell me it's a fantasy because it doesn't follow sonata form. Um, and so there's some technical reasons for that. Um, so I titled it Fantasy Opus One, subtitled The Lightning Sonata. And that I can get away with. <laughs> and so that piece of music I, I finished writing and right about then Oliver calls and says, would it be okay if I use your story in my book? And I thought, sure, what, you know, how, how could that harm me? And I said yes, and he said, oh, by the way, first chapter's going to be in the New Yorker next week. And I thought, okay, well, that's, I'm not quite ready for that. And so it came out in the New Yorker, and then it came out in a book, and suddenly I was asked by the college in um, the State University in New, in New York. Um, at Oneonta, they have a big performing arts theater and they asked me to do a concert. Mm -hmm. So that what you were seeing on the video was that, that concert. And that was the first time that I ever played in public. And to make it even worse, I don't know how they found out, but the BBC found out, Granada Media, German National Television, and so there were three television crews there um, to see somebody who'd never played in public before, and I thought, I'm just going to die and get it over with. <laughs> because it, I, I've never been so terrified. I remember walking out into the auditorium, and, and I just felt like somebody grabbed me around the throat and just held their hands right there. And I was like, oh, oh God. And I remember thinking, you know what? God, you put me through all of this crap. I can only assume that you're not going to leave me alone out there. And and I was able to get through it without messing up too bad. And so it was an amazing experience. And and it really has taken on a life of its own. Um, I don't publicize it. I don't promote it. Um, but when somebody calls me like Diane um, or a number of other organizations that I have done this for, I know that it's pure and it's important. It's something that I need to do because there's somebody who's going to hear it and it's going to change their life. And, and that seems to be where I go with all of this. And how has it changed me? Well, I, I really kind of let all of the academic stuff that I was involved with go by the wayside. And just, there was no interest in, in earthly things and, or, or in pushing myself in, in that direction. You know, I became much more of a um, a people person and and it gave me a, a totally different perspective on the people I was taking care of and the people who surrounded me and myself so I became much more spiritual um, much less religious because none of the things that I experienced conformed to anybody's religion and I was brought up Catholic, and certainly by Catholic standards, I was a heretic. <laughs> and, uh, and I was willing to accept that. Um, but I think that what I experienced is probably pretty close to what is true. Um, that we, we keep coming around and doing all these things. We reincarnate. Um, which some people don't like to hear. 
Um, but I'm absolutely certain of that because I've, I was able to be outside of my body, see it, <coughs> continually think. There was never a millisecond that I wasn't aware of everything that was happening. And so I knew that whoever I was, I always was. And since then, I've also encountered a lot of people that I've met before who have been significant people in my life at other times. And, and it's disconcerting when it happens. Um, sometimes I will look at somebody and I see them as I, I had seen them in previous lifetime, which, which is really strange. And I know things about them that there's no possible way I could know because I'm not intimately associated with them, but I just know things that I shouldn't know. And so I have to be careful how I approach some of those things. Uh, but I'm also able to help people more because you, I can see beyond <coughs> a lot of the things that people experience. Um, and I think that that's important. I know a lot of doctors just come in with a sore throat and they want to give you a pill and go. So nobody has the time to talk to people to find out what's really going on. And, and so I, I think I have an advantage that sometimes I just know um, what is going on with somebody even though they haven't said anything. So my life has changed fairly dramatically. And, and a lot of times I can feel people's aura. I can't always see it. Most of the time I can't, because I have to really struggle to do that. But I can feel it very easily. And I can feel if, if someone's got something wrong, there's an electrical disturbance that surrounds it. And it's kind of like rubbing your hand through static electricity on a face of a television set. And so that's something that's helpful. I can sense things that maybe somebody else may not. Um, but it's always an adventure. Um, and the adventure continues. Um, the music, you know, it's interesting because of, of the things that I've experienced and I, you know, I have this music that the music in the dream was just given to me as one lump sum. Boom, here it is. Um, but I've had the same experience with other pieces of music that I've written, and and it comes sometimes it's, it just comes as whole movements. And I've had whenever I sit down and play, I might, there's some connection that I must have with wherever music comes from. Because sometimes, I, I, I remember distinctly, I, one of my lessons was a Brahms variation on a Schumann theme. And I started to play it, and I got through the first three measures, and suddenly it wasn't piano. I wasn't hearing a piano, even though I was playing it. I was hearing a symphony. And I, I was so struck by it, I stopped playing. But it didn't, and it kept playing. And so the, there's a whole first movement of a symphony based on, on that variation that's just sitting there waiting for me to write it. Um, since I can't write for other instruments, it's going to be a while. <laughs> but my solution to that has been my son, um, who is a student at Berkeley College of Music in Boston. And last year, and, and this is an amazing thing even of itself, because I mean, there's lots of artists who talk about where music comes from. Mozart was very vocal about it. It comes from heaven. I get it as big sheets of music, and all I have to do is write it down. Brahms said something very similar in a book called Talks with the Great Composers. Um, Brahms made them promise that it would not be published until 50 years after his death. But in it, he talks about his muse. He talks about the trance that he would go into 
and he would connect with someplace else, and the music would just come. And, and he quotes Beethoven as saying very similar things. And so you have, you have the great master saying, this music is coming from someplace. And, and you have little guys like me who, who say, yeah, it's not something I'm making up. Somebody's giving it to me. And at the same time, you have quantum mechanics physicists who are saying, the brain is a receiver of information. It has not the capability or big enough to generate all the things that we say it can. And you start to think, okay, well, you start to wonder, you know, if there were the receivers, who's sending it? Where is it coming from? And that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but it certainly is possible. My son, this past summer, summer before, he comes home from school, and I had, I had just started to write a piece of music. Um, it's a concerto in C minor for piano and orchestra. And I was just starting the piano part, and it had just come to me, so I, I wrote down a little bit of it. And he came home to visit, and I was in my bedroom, and I hear him out at my piano. And I'm, I'm saying to myself, oh, that sounds familiar. I'm listening to it. He's playing what I just wrote. <laughs> and I said to him, so I went out and I said, where did you get that? Where did you hear it? He said, I don't know. I was just sitting here and it came to me. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's really strange. <laughs> so I said, get up a second and pull out this piece of music, which is at this point is only half a page long. And I played for him what I had just written. And we, the two of us, we just kind of looked at each other like, holy crap, <laughs> that's really amazing. And at that point we said, let's do this together. Obviously it's something we're meant to do. But then we put it on the back shelf because he was busy, I was busy. And, and then in the fall, I got a call from Piccolo Spoleto. It's a big arts festival in Charleston, South Carolina each year. And my college, the Citadel, uh, wanted to do a show with them as a fundraiser for the school. And they asked me if I would do one. And I said yes, and, and I said, you know, but all I have is piano music at this point. And I said, but I'm working on this piece for orchestra. And they said, well, we can't afford an orchestra right now. so." Let's just go with the piano stuff. And I said, fine. So I stopped working on it. And then in December, my mom passed, which is an amazing story in and of itself. Um, but the next day, guess who calls? Gee, remember that piece of music you were talking about? I said, yeah. Well, can you do it? And you got to be kidding me. It's only five months from now. And they said, well, can you or not? And I said, I have no idea. And the day before, my son had come to me and he said, Dad, I need to take a semester off. He said, music school is killing my creativity. <laughs> and, and I thought, I need a better explanation than that. I said, what are you gonna do? I said, you're not gonna sit around. I said, if you're gonna work, fine. But if you're just going to sit around and get in trouble, we're not going to do that. He said, no, I have these things that I want to work on. And I said, all right, let me think about it. And of course, the next day they call. And, and I think, well, this is an, an interesting occurrence. And so I, the next day, I, I, I corner him and I say, Chris, I'll let you take the semester off, but I need your help. He said, I, I've committed to do this, and I have absolutely no idea how to write for other instruments. And if you'll do it with me, then I'll agree to the other stuff. And so we sat down and we started, and we worked every, every single night from whenever I got home till we were falling asleep standing up. And it was a huge task um, to write a, 
a three movement piece. Um, and I wrote the piano part, he wrote all the instruments. And we presented it last month, June 5th. Um, and, you know, one of, the, one of the best parts of that experience was I got to do something with one of my kids that I will never be able to duplicate again. And I got to know him in a way that I never would be able to. And I'm eternally grateful. Um, I've come to realize that he and I have done this before. And, you know, in the process of going through all of these things, I've, I've been to numerous psychics and age regression and Akashic records and you name it, I've looked at it. Because, number one, I'm curious. Number two, I want to make some sense out of all of this because it's important to have some understanding of it. Now, I have no more understanding now than I ever did, but I've at least been exposed to some new ideas. And, and I think that, that that's critical. Uh, so who knows where it goes from here. Anyway. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, apparently, are, are you saying that during your path, your near-death experience, somehow a portal was opened up that allowed you to access this realm of this beautiful music coming through you? Or are you suggesting that it's coming from a past life, that you were able to retrieve a past life gift, or both? Okay. Repeat it's a good question. question. Repeat the um, question. The, the question is, is, are you saying that you have opened a portal to music that comes to you from the crossing over, or is this something that you brought with you from a past life that now you can access? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Oliver Sacks says that I've always had it. It's in the genes, and it was housed in part of the brain that I was not able to access. And he thinks that somehow the lightning dusted off some circuits and <laughs> I had access to it. And, and I think that's, that's a plausible explanation. Uh, it doesn't explain the fact that it comes in great big chunks. It's not drips and drabs of, oh, I remember this. It comes as whole pieces, and it comes from some place that I don't understand. <laughs> and the fact that my son, who has no real connection to me, hears the same stuff um, makes me think that it's coming from someplace else. But I also believe that there has to be a storehouse of knowledge that I have access to from previous knowledge and previous lives. Because I can do things with my 12 years of experience that I shouldn't be able to do based on conversations with with other pianists and, and people who have spent their entire life learning the stuff. I mean, I, when I go to my piano camp, one of the, you know, everybody likes to make fun of me and they talk about, I'm, you know, if it's thundering and lightning, you, people are saying, I'm going out with a lightning rod. I'm going out with a rod. <laughs> because I want to be able to do that. <laughs> and, and so I have some perspective on the fact that I'm not normal. And I probably wasn't before. <laughs> but I wasn't smart enough to realize it. Yes, sir. Um, did you have a lot of uh, talk about um, you know, body experiences or the kinds of experiences like you have with the phone. Um, some people will go and verify after they are able to talk to people, you know, like with a nurse or with your mother. You're able to have this conversation about what you saw them actually do? Yeah. Um, I have talked to, actually, I tried to track the nurse down. Um, and she seemed to have vaporized. Mm -hmm. 
um, and I was not able to get hold of her. Um, but my mother-in-law, who stood there and watched all of it, verified it, and they, you know, they, there were other cousins, um, my ex and my nieces and nephews that came, who came running downstairs and saw the same thing. And, and my wife and a number of other people who, you know, said the whole thing was about 15 minutes. And, uh, you know, we're able to verify all the stuff that happened. You know, I don't have an electronic tracing that said that my heart had stopped. Um, and I don't know if it matters. Yes, sir. What I'm struck by is that a, um, of all the arts, music seems to be the most purely emotional. And you've described yourself earlier as being having a military back or uh, <laughs> academy and, and as an empiricist and rather unemotional. Can you tell me, just like kind of autobiographically, uh, do you feel, what has this done for your integration of your, like your personality, of your being emotional or um, empirical? I look at everything differently now. I, before I tried to look at everything as, is it black or white? And now everything is in gray. And, wow. and it is. There, there, are, there are no rules. And everything that, and one of the things that I've become very clear about is that there's everything that happens, everyone you meet, there is something you're supposed to get from that interaction. And as Einstein said, God doesn't throw dice. Everything that happens has a purpose. I'm trying to figure out what it is, it's <laughs> mind boggling But, you know, to your idea about you know, the emotional interaction and connection with music, Oliver Sacks and Alan Yento. Alan Yento was the head of the BBC. And they did an experiment. They took three pieces of music music that they didn't like, music that they liked, so-so, music that they absolutely loved, that they resonated completely with. And they played that music while they had functional MRI images done of their brains. So when they set this experiment up, if the brain reacted to the music, on the scan it would turn red. And so when they listened to the music that they didn't like, the brain did nothing. When they listen to music that they like, the little patches lit up in the brain, which people just sort of expect. When they listen to music that they absolutely love, that captivated every ounce of their emotion, the brain turned completely red, wall to wall, front to back. And they had no idea what to do. I remember seeing the radiologist standing there going, it wasn't what they expected because the brain likes to segregate things, you know. Feeling is over here, motor functions over there, smell is over here, vision's over there. It likes to keep things separate. But the brain is very plastic. If, if something gets damaged, it can train some other part to do it. But normally it likes to separate things. And so how do you explain the way that the brain normally works with a brain that's completely involved with that music. And it's coming from an emotional place. So it says that there is something that ties music and emotion together. And nobody really knows what that is at this point, um, other than the fact that it's an interesting curiosity. And, and you know, it, in when I'm talking about Oliver, it, it's always obvious that, you know, He's on one side of the fence, I'm on the other side of the fence. And we spar back and forth. And I think secretly Oliver Sacks wants somebody to prove to him that these things exist. Because it's the kind of person he is. He's not gonna just accept something because you say it is. And, but there's a whole group of, of people that think like that. And, and I gave this talk to the Department of Neurology at Johns Hopkins, which was a great 
interchange because they're mostly over here with him. And we talked about cases. And the, the neurobiologists like to cite cases. And one of the famous ones is Olaf Blank's case out of Geneva, Switzerland. Now, this is a woman who had seizures. They couldn't stop them with medications they tried. And they thought, OK, we're going to electronically map her brain, and we're going to find the part of the brain that's bad, and we're going to remove it. That'll stop the seizures. Mm -hmm. So they implant 102 different electrodes in her brain, and they start to test each one. And when they hit an electrode over on the right side of the brain called the temporal lobe in the amygdala, and when they stimulated that electrode, she said, oh my god. And everybody was like, what's the matter? She said, I'm on the ceiling. And they said, what do you mean you're on the ceiling? She said, I'm on the ceiling. I can see you. She said, but part of me is still attached to the body. She said, my feet are still attached. But part of me is up here. Hmm. And they said, OK. So they turned it off. I'm back. Turned it on. I'm up on the ceiling again. Turned it off. I'm back. Turned it back on. I'm still up here. And she said, and so she ex described everything she saw and, and the fact that she was still connected to her body. From that, they extrapolated that when somebody is dying, the brain has this sort of a reaction because it's lacking oxygen and it's dying and it could be hallucinations or it could be a term that they've point called autoscopy and to explain it. So they've taken cases like that and they want to beat the other guys over the head and say, you see this? We're telling you that it's just all circuits. We should be able to explain it on the basis of that. And so the other side, who we'll call the more mystical side, says, well, we understand that case. But we have some good cases, too. And, and probably one of the most celebrated case is Pam Reynolds. And that's a pseudonym. Pam had a, a large aneurysm, which is a, a sac at the base of the brain with a blood vessel, got a big bubble on it, and it was going to burst. But it's in a place that is very, very difficult to get to. And most of the time, it's fatal. If it bursts, you're going to die, period. If you have surgery, there's a good chance you're going to die um, because it's that delicate. And her, her physician, Michael Sabon, um, wrote a book called Light and Death. And she was one of the cases. And in that, he talks about her case. He sent her to Phoenix, Arizona because there was a place called Barrow Neurologic Institute there. And what they were going to do was they could treat cases like this, but what they would have to do is they have to put them on heart bypass, stop their heart, cool the body down to 60 degrees, drain all the brain blood, drain the brain, drain the blood out of the brain. Then open the head, fix the aneurysm, warm her back up, put the blood back, maybe she's alive, maybe she's not. <laughs> so, but at this point, what choice did they have? Leaving it alone was not an option. So she said, okay, I want to do that. So they take her to surgery, and they put her to sleep, they open up her head, they get everything exposed, and then the cardiac surgeons put these big plastic catheters into the arteries and veins in her legs, and they take all the blood and they drain it out. And they cool it down first to 60 degrees. So her body temperature's now 60 degrees. And then they tilt the table up and they let all of the blood run out into this bin. They quickly fix the aneurysm. They put the bed back down. But the critical piece of information here is when they did all of that, they're monitoring her heart and her brain. Her heart is complete standstill because they paralyzed it. And her brain has zero activity. There's no electrical activity coming from her brain 
she's dead. By any stretch of the imagination, she's dead, either artificially or real. There's nothing going on. So they put the blood right back in her brain, they warm her back up, they had to shock her heart because it wouldn't restart. And she goes to the intensive care unit, and she finally starts talking. And then so she's talking to the doctors, and she said, you were there. And he says, how do you know? And she said, because you were there, so-and-so was there, this person was there, there were 20 people, and there was these pieces of equipment, and she told them what they did. And then the most damning thing was, and she said, and why did you have to keep playing that one piece of music over and over again? And what was that? The Hotel California. <laughs> because the residents were closing the case and they put on the music. Because the big guys were stepping aside so that they could do their work. And there was one line that kept playing over and over again. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. And so she related this story of having left her body and this tunnel opened up and her uncle and somebody else were up there in the tunnel waiting for her and they walked with her to a certain point and they said, well, you got to go back. And so she's kind of walked back with them and, and she says, I don't want to go back. And she's, she's standing there up on the tunnel looking down at her body and she said, that body looks terrible. <laughs> said, I'm not going back in that thing. It looks like somebody beat the hell out of me. <laughs> and so she's standing there, and she, and she finally looks at her uncle, and she says, I'm not going. He said, yes, you are, and he pushes her. <laughs> the, the push most likely coincided with electronic shock, um, because then she would back in. But So here's a situation where you have documented no cardiac activity, absolutely no brain function whatsoever, yet somebody has complete recall, not only for what was there, who was there, the way the equipment was set up, and what music was being played. And so you take that case, and there's hundreds of cases like that, that, that both the INDS have and, and that are in the literature. And you, you take that and you say, hey guys, and we're talking to the neurobiologists, and you say, this case says that you're missing something. Ridicule, nonsense. Um, and, I, and I think to a large extent, you know, their, their favorite line is show us the data. Okay, oh, this looks like data to me. <laughs> but they're not willing to address it at this point. And, and that's okay. But I, I think that from a human standpoint, those kinds of cases are absolutely <coughs> clear evidence that life is more than the sum of its parts. There's a whole lot more, more going on than, than we have any concept of. So, but, you know, you still have to consider both sides of the argument. And, and I think that it's always a challenge to do that. Yes, ma'am. Um, you indicated that you had some sensitivity to aura as well as sometimes you may have recognized somebody from a past life and you know things that you shouldn't know. I wonder if you could expound on that and also have you looked into developing this um, ability to a greater extent? Um, I have. The, the question is, is, since have I looked into developing more the capabilities of being able to feel auras and see auras um, and have I started to move down the road of, of developing those, those sorts of qualities. 
Um, and I've really only started doing that. Um, the other part of the question was is in recognizing people from, from past lives, how, how vivid is that? Now I'll give you an example. Um, I, I met a girl who I found very attractive. And unexplainably, you know, it was just very, very intense. And, and I remember thinking, Man, what is it with this? <laughs> And when I would look at her, I would actually see someone else. And, but at first, she looked very similar. And finally, one day I said to her, I said, I, I gotta talk to you about this. I said, I'm, I'm having all these feelings and I'm seeing things and I keep, I keep seeing an Indian princess. I said, I, I keep seeing an Indian princess and it doesn't make any sense to me. And I can, as I look at you, I see this other person with the long straight hair and the band on the arm and, and she just kind of looked at me and kind of stepped back and I said, what's the matter? She said, my nickname as a child was Indian princess. And she said, she, when she was in nursing school, she took care of the chief of the Onondaga nation. And when she walked into the room the first time, he looked at her and spoke Indian dialect. Um. And she said, I'm sorry, sir, I, I don't know the language. And he said, you should, you're the Indian princess. Um, and and there were things that I, I just knew about her that I had no business knowing. She had three children, I knew that there was a fourth that had been aborted, and she had three tattoos and there was another one coming. I mean, wild stuff that I had no way of knowing. And, and I thought, okay. And, and so, you know, I, you know, one of the things that I, when I went through age regression and Akashic Records reading, I was trying to find out why. And, and this was someone who, on a soul level, um, we had spent several lifetimes together and had made a promise to meet up in this lifetime. Um, but we're on, you know, we're on different pathways. Um, so although our, our paths have crossed, and maybe they'll be, maybe they'll cross again, but um, it's just amazing to me that, it, that I've had that, that connection and that I was able to recognize it for what it was. But it also made me aware that everyone I meet, I'm suspect of. Okay. I must believe something. And then it's and then, you know, and then you start second guessing yourself and it gets kind of crazy. I mean the whole thing is kind of crazy. If I was a normal person and I was sitting here listening to this, I'd go, you better lock these people up. But it's all very real. And the fact that people have gone through this experience over and over and over again. There's, there's 30 books out there that talk about all of these things. And people have experiences all the time. And the experiences that children have. And that those are probably some of the more prolific ones. And yet, a lot of that just gets discounted. Oh, the kids. Okay. Um, and but little kids have nothing to gain. Right. You have a three-year-old, my my physician's assistant, who really doesn't believe a lot of this sort of stuff. Her her daughter's three years old. This was ten years ago. And she, they were sitting on the edge of the bed, and and the daughter said, "He's looking at somebody." looking at something and her mother says what are you doing she said grandma's over there three-year-old and she says there's no one there stop it she said yes there is she's right there and she says no there's no one there please stop and then the kid says yes there is mommy Look beyond what you see. 
you know, who's, you know, I, unfortunately, we have to blame ourselves for a lot of the things that are happening. These kids are coming up and they're saying, I see dead people. No, you don't. Don't be stupid. Let's we'll ridicule the child. The child will suppress any idea that it ever saw any of those things. And so we lost that because they'll never say it again and they'll certainly not say it in front of their friends because as much as you think you've said something to damage them, their kid, their friends will destroy them. And it's unfortunate. There's nothing we can do about that. Yes, ma'am. So for those of us who haven't been, in my opinion, fortunate enough to have had some experience like you've had that sort of validates a reality larger than ourselves, what advice do you have for um, becoming a better person or feeling a greater sense of peace about life and death and um, I don't know, just advice along those lines um, about overcoming fear or why I'm here, those kinds of things. I, I think if you approach everything from a standpoint of love, you can never go wrong. No matter what it is the idea or no matter what it is the decision you're faced with, you approach it from a good place. And you, you ask yourself, does this feel good or does it feel bad? If you always err on the side of, feels good, the outcome is always going to be good. And that's not always an easy thing to do. Um, and so I think that that's, that's one of the big things. Um, I think being honest um, about your feelings and really being critical about what it is you're feeling and, and why you're feeling it, um, I think enter into those things. Um, it's hard to advise people about life's decisions. And I think that if you have a rule of, of thumb, which is to approach everything from the same place, <laughs> then you're always going to be farther ahead because you don't have to remember, well, in this situation I do this, or in this situation I do that. Um, if you approach everything from, from a, a place of love, from the heart, then you win. And you think it's been easier for you to do that? since your near-death experience? Hell no. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it has been very difficult. Um, and, and there's been an evolution. I mean, when I, it took me years to understand what happened and what I was going through and, and, and the, the just volumes and volumes of things that I read to try to understand. And I don't know how much clearer it has gotten because it's very nebulous. You don't, there's nothing to really hang your hat on. And it all comes down to, to faith. You know, do you believe that there is something or do you believe that there's not? I believe that there is. And I have experienced it. It was very powerful. And and I know that if I approach things from a place of good and a place of positive energy, then I make the right decisions. And if I don't, I've been spanked. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, I, I uh, you know, outside of the experience that you had that was very, um, let's say, succinct, you know, it was very real, experience for you. Speak louder, please. Um, is there, I mean, uh, I was asking the question about uh, whether um, outside the experience of having, you know, the lightning and that whole experience that you went through as being a very succinct experience, in coming to start writing music and, and making this journey from where you were to a more spiritual uh, let's say enlightened being. Were there points along the way 
I, because this has been my experience, I'm just kind of you know, fishing for what's been yours. Were the points along, along the way, and it kind of resonates with the conversation we, we just had, where you knew there's a kind of knowing that comes. I mean, you can't really put your finger on it, you can't prove it, but there's a kind of knowing in making the, that, those discernments between love and what's not love, and what's right and what's wrong, so to speak. Not that there's anything wrong, but about making those choices. I mean, something kind of drives this whole adventure, and it comes from a, another place, kind of. It's it's a what I call like a, a, a knowing or a download. And I just wanted to know if you've had any of those experiences. I think that those are continual experiences. I don't think there's a day that goes by that I'm not faced with a choice about something. You know. What do I have to do about this situation? And so what I and and I try to approach it from does it feel good or does it feel bad? And that's not my idea. I, and one of the one of the people that I see on a regular basis, a psychic, um, she's a psychic medium, and, and I've learned to trust her implicitly. And and she will say, all decisions can be based on good or bad. And she said, what you have to do is, is just feel the decision. Don't think about it. Feel it. And does it feel good or does it feel bad? And feeling good is very different than feeling bad. And, and so I, I try very hard to just follow that. Sometimes I make the wrong choice. Um, but it becomes very obvious. And so I think... In life, we learn more by making the wrong choice than we do by making the right one. Because if you make all right choices, nothing happens. You just kind of sail along your path. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I have actually a comment to make in response to that question of, is there anything we can do other than have a near-death experience that can allow us to know that this other realm exists and to have a direct experience with it? And I'm going to say something very radical. I think that we need to move toward the day when we can all take psychedelic or entheogenic drugs because they reveal this to us. I've experienced out of body and being separate from my body and knowing that I go on without having had to die because of ingesting these uh, medicinal, I would say, substances. And I've also opened the portal to tremendous creativity through writing, poetry, music, I, because I think that all belongs to the spiritual realm. And uh, I think it's possible that if we got past our horrible fear and judgments about these substances and moved past the war on drugs, we could all have these experiences, especially under the guidance of someone who can be there and facilitate this for us, to all grow tremendously and overcome. I have no fear of death whatsoever after having gone through that. Timothy Leary would love you. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is exactly, there's a great truth to that. Right. Um, one of the things that is being worked on, and Daniel Brinkley brought this back from the other side, which is a table that can electronically simulate a vibration that causes you to leave your body. And, and, it, it, and I know that's being worked on because I was at a party several months ago and I was just talking to somebody casually and, and he got, his eyes got really big and, and I'm like, what's up? He said, I was one of the scientists working on that in New Jersey, on that table. Wow. And I thought, oh, this is a little weird connection. Um, but they are doing it. And, it. and he was telling me about the experiments that they were doing with this thing. And they're trying to recreate 